Right, so the next project we have here for the bench is this little Yesu FT817. This is a HF, VHF, and UHF uh, all-mode transceiver. Uh, just 5 watts output designed for portable use. And uh, the reason I have it here is that uh, it receives fine on all bands and all modes, but apparently does not transmit properly on single sideband, while it does transmit okay on FM. Now, of course, before taking on any kind of a repair job, you want to make sure you understand what the radio does and doesn't do. As we mentioned, it does does receive just fine. It's receiving some lower sideband on uh, 40 meters. Uh, and uh, I've checked out the receiver on, on all the bands and all the modes. It seems to be okay. Uh, and uh, it does transmit on FM. That's fine at full power. So I know the finals are good. Uh, even on, uh, on HF, so I know the HF finals are good. Um, what I did find is that if I uh, transmit on single sideband, I can hear it ever so slightly on my other receiver here. So that tells me that uh, at least something is being generated. So let's, uh, let's check out what we've got. Now reviewing the documentation uh, and service manual for this radio, I learned that the single sideband signal is generated by you know, mixing the audio uh, in a double balanced mixer which outputs a double sideband suppressed carrier signal and then when you select upper or lower sideband you're sending the, that double sideband signal through a filter to reject either the upper or lower sideband. So we need to determine uh, if what I'm hearing on my other receiver here is the double sideband signal or if it's single sideband. Uh, because if, uh, depending on which that is, that will help to narrow down what portion of the circuit I need to go look at. Uh, because if I only hear a single sideband signal, then I know the problem is somewhere after that uh, sideband filter. Okay, to check this out, I've got the, the 817 on 7.185 megahertz. I've got my uh, main HF receiver here on the same frequency. But what I'm going to do is switch uh, the 817 to uh, transmit into a dummy load. And my uh, 870 is just uh, going through uh, essentially the shorting position of the switch. But I did notice before that I was able to hear it. So I turn this volume up here. I've got the rig set to lower sideband. And if I uh, key up the microphone and speak into it, I'm getting uh, my signal through the speaker here. So I can certainly tell that I'm transmitting on lower sideband. So now what I'll do is switch the rig to upper sideband and see if I can hear uh, my signal. If I had the double sideband signal, I'd be able to hear it as well. So now the, my main receiver is on upper side, and if I key the mic, I'm speaking into it, I can't hear it. So that tells me that I'm actually transmitting lower sideband here. I switched back to lower sideband, now I can hear it uh, coming out of my receiver. Now, of course, that result is very interesting because now it tells me that the, uh, the whole mixing process to create the double sideband signal is working properly and the filtering to, to filter out the upper or lower sideband is also working properly. So the problem is somewhere between that upper and lower sideband filter selection and uh, the rest of the upstream, you know, uh, up conversion and output stage. Uh, we know the finals are good, so we know that the problem is not going to be with the final amplifier, so it's somewhere in between there. So the next thing we have to do is uh, study the block diagram a little bit more to understand where we want to focus and looking at servicing it, and then get the schematics out and start poking around. Okay, so now it's time to dig into schematics and block diagrams to try to isolate those portions of the circuit that would cause uh, single sideband uh, AM and CW to all be very, very low in output. At this point, I'd like to really uh, give a big thanks to Clint, KA7OEI. He's got a great set of web pages on the FT817 that uh, not only uh, give a really nice uh, description of um, the circuit uh, for the 817, but also has some large format schematics uh, available for it as well. And I found these extremely useful because if you look in the PDF file, the service manual, the schematics and the block diagrams are all, you know, relatively small and you've got to zoom way in on them to actually uh, see what's going on. To me, it's a lot easier to have one big piece of paper where you can see everything that's happening. Uh, here's the block diagram and you'll notice it's printed on a pretty big sheet of paper. Uh, I don't have a printer 
that can uh, print things this big, let alone the schematic, which is uh, even bigger than that. That's on a three foot wide piece of paper. So what I did is I took the, the schematic and block diagram files from Clint's website and I wound up uploading them to, uh, to my local Staples store and uh, printed them out as engineering prints. And uh, the big uh, two by three foot schematic here literally cost me about three dollars and this one cost me about two dollars to have printed and uh, really makes it invaluable. To me it's a lot easier to kind of go looking around on these very big single sheet pages than to try to scroll around you know on a schematic or something like that on an iPad or a, or a PC. So the next thing we want to do is trace out the transmit paths for single sideband uh, AM, CW, as well as uh, the FM and uh, digital and packet paths that are working to figure out which portion of the circuit are common to those modes that are having trouble. So with the help of the block diagram as well as uh, the circuit description uh, pages from the service manual and the uh, really good description that Clint has on his website for uh, the transmit path operation, I was able to kind of trace out uh, where uh, the AM single sideband and CW transmit paths are. All right, starting at the the microphone input here, there's a mic preamp, and then from there the audio path starts to split right after this uh, this gain stage here. Uh, the the audio path that goes this way is actually the FM modulator path, and that goes all the way in ultimately to the final. Uh, uh, RF mixer and then the RF output stages that are kind of coming off the board here. But that path is working. So we really know the, uh, the microphone is working fine. We all kind of know that's working fine anyway because we can hear uh, the like single sideband and AM modes just at a very low level. But if we continue to follow that path around, we go through another amplifier and filter and then go into our first mixing stage here, balance modulator. This uh, basically up converts um, the audio and modulates it to the first IF which is 455 kilohertz uh, for both uh, single sideband as well as uh, CW. Uh, the, the signal coming out of the balance modulator is for single sideband is a double sideband suppressed carrier signal uh, and then there's an offset that's kind of injected in to create the carrier for, for the CW mode. That signal then goes up to a series of diode switches, there's three of them here, that select the appropriate filter to send that signal through to filter out uh, the appropriate uh, sideband or the sideband you're not using or to pass that uh, the AM signal through here. Then there's another set of switches that it goes through and goes into a second mixer for the second transmit IF. Uh, that goes, it gets buffered, the mixer is here, the LO is being provided by a, um, essentially a, a, an oscillator that's taking the third harmonic from the reference oscillator, bandpass filtering that is the LO, goes in through another switch uh, and through another filter to, to select the appropriate mixing component from that mixer and that signal then comes down and goes into uh, what, what's going to work its way into the final uh, filtering stage and to the output board. So that's our path and basically all of this that I've got highlighted here is common for all of the modes that I'm having trouble with. So really the troubleshooting process is starting to trace this signal through to be sure that all these components are working right. Now there's the schematic for just the main board. There are a couple of other boards inside the 817 but this is the schematic for just the main board. Again I had this printed out on a two foot by three foot piece of paper. <laughs> Uh, to make it readable. You can kind of see the size of this thing relative to my iPhone. Uh, so it took a while to you know, trace through where everything is on the circuit, but our microphone input is down here. And then that first uh, microphone preamp is here. These are the buffers that are driving the audio uh, that are going into the first mixer, which is right here. The output of that first mixer is then going up, in, up to these switches over here, which are selecting the various filters um, for that uh, signal. Then, then the signal comes through this switch here and winds up coming over to this mixer here. So there's our buffer and then this mixer it gets an LO from another device. That then goes, that output then goes up into another set of switches through another filter and then working our way back down into this uh, 
uh, final uh, driver, there it is right here, <laughs> that's uh, coming down into this area right here, and this is what finally goes into some more switches through the filters out to the transmit stage. So our problem really lies generally from here back up through uh, these other mixing stages. So when making measurements, you know, only about half of these components are on the top side of the board, and uh, we'll see in a moment when we go down and look at the rig. Um, you, know, you really can't take the main board out and still have the unit functional. So you try to have to kind of go through and see what components are available along the paths you want to measure uh, to go see if the signals are there. I was able to verify that the microphone signal getting preamplified right is all good. Everything coming up through this first mixer that brings us to our 455 uh, kilohertz transmit IF is fine. That IF signal is making it up towards the filters. I wasn't able to really probe too much around these filters because most of these switching diodes and all are on the bottom of the board. So the way I tested those was I, I pulled the board out and just did a quick diode check on all of these switching diodes to be sure the diodes are all still in good shape. And they all were fine. So, um, so we know that everything was working through here and when I was able to probe some of these spots I found that I was able to get that 455 kilohertz uh, you know, transmit IF right up to this second mixer. Now this mixer is where things got interesting because the IF signal appeared there just fine but the output of the mixer uh, was very very low and uh, it was only it was supposed to be in the order of about 200 millivolts peak, uh, RMS and I was only seeing about 20 millivolts RMS at the output of the mixer. So I took a look at the LO uh, coming into that mixer and it was very low that's kind of odd. So, uh, so that's where we kind of concentrated, taking a look at what was going on. So back on the block diagram here, um, we've got that mixer right here. This is where our, our uh, IF signal is coming in. The LO signal is coming in here from a bandpass filter that is looking at the output of this transistor, which is essentially multiplying the um, reference frequency by three, or basically just pulling the third harmonic off of that and then bring that into uh, the mixer. So if we take a look at where that is on the schematic, we find that uh, to be right here. So there, there's that transistor. Our bandpass filter is composed of these two kind of IF cans and the associated capacitors. Now Clint gave me another really uh, interesting tip is that uh, when he was repairing one of his 817s years ago, he had a receive path problem the problem turned out to be one of these IF transformers had mysteriously just opened. The coil was no longer continuous. There was just an open circuit. So armed with that knowledge, I was making a habit of looking at uh, all of the transformer coils with an ohmmeter just to make sure they were all continuous. Uh, because, you know, since he had that one problem, I thought, you know, maybe I'd get lucky. And it turns out I did. turns out that uh, this transformer here, T1026, the connection between ground and the center tap of the primary of this transformer was open. And it wasn't a soldering problem, I kind of resoldered that connection, so it wasn't that, but the, the part itself had gone bad. So here's Yesu's uh, part number for that transformer. I was able to order it from Yesu in California, it was only a couple of dollars. Actually cost more to ship it than the part was. And uh, when I replaced that, uh, I was able to restore appropriate LO drive to the second uh, transmit IF mixer right here. Uh, so all I had to do is install that and then re-peak the, uh, the slugs or essentially realign the slugs in here to tune this bandpass filter to be right at the third harmonic of that reference frequency. And then once I restored that, I was able to get sufficient output from the mixer and everything returned to full power in the troublesome modes. Having some enlarged copies of the uh, board and component layout diagrams here uh, is really handy as well. Uh, I just did these myself by uh, uh, taking these images out of the service manual and uh, printing, you know, each half, you know, kind of double size and then taped them together. But that really helped to then locate the components on the schematic to where they were on the board. Well, here's the rig opened up on the bench. As you can see, that uh, it's a very very tight layout. Uh, and portions of it here and you're only looking at the top side of one of the couple of boards that are in this rig. I apologize for not having any of the detailed uh, bench troubleshooting work on video 
but because of the density of this board I spent most of my time looking through a little handheld magnifier like this or my uh, illuminated uh, magnifier here or even both to see what was going on and it just wasn't convenient to have the camera in here as well so I thought the, the video describing the debug process that I went through would, uh, would still help some folks out uh, what did help out in uh, some cases here in looking at this is that on the top side of this board uh, that, that first transmit mixer is this guy right here that second transmit mixer is that guy right there both of those are traditional 8-pin dips so it made it very easy to probe the inputs and outputs of those two mixers uh, and the uh, two uh, transformer cans that are associated with that uh, the LO for the second mixer are these two guys right here and this guy, of course, the one that's nestled down between the other two, is the one that had a, uh, an open on its uh, tapped primary. So that's the device that I replaced. Uh, there are a lot of components that were on the other side of the board that I, uh, I simply couldn't get to when, you know, and power the device up. So a lot of that troubleshooting was you know, lifting this board out, turning it over, and just doing component level checks uh, with uh, a multimeter to kind of verify those components. So we did get lucky uh, with the advice from Clint and with what we could probe on the top to be able to isolate it down to that particular transformer. Okay, with the rig turned on in FM mode, we'll take a look at the, uh, the RF watt meter here. And we can see that we're getting uh, just a touch over five watts of uh, output power on FM at full power. We'll switch the mode of the rig here to uh, to CW, and uh, again take a look at the uh, the meter. And again, we can see we can see that same uh, just over five watts of output power. So now we'll switch the rig to uh, upper sideband, and I'm going to turn on the peak adapter on my RF watt meter here. And now speaking into the microphone, uh, we can see that the uh, peak RF power is basically right at 5 watts, which is uh, exactly what it ought to be. So probably not the most exciting uh, repair video because uh, we didn't really show too much of the actual process of making measurements and uh, testing components. But I think maybe the value here was uh, understanding the process, uh, really understanding what the radio was doing right and what it was doing wrong and using that information to narrow down what portions of the circuit we needed to go look at and then methodically going through that and looking for and tracing signals through those paths to identify the faulty component. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I think I got lucky here in this case that uh, I was able to troubleshoot it uh, using you know test points that were available on the top side of the board and able to isolate the, the fault that way. Sometimes you just don't get that lucky this time we were. Anyway, thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed the video, uh, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and uh, tell your friends. And we'll look for you next time. Thanks for watching.